Are you suggesting we surrender to the Separatists? What's up, my nerds? In this video, we'll pull from every Legends and Canon source available to completely understand the Ishii Tip, a sentient species originating from Tabrin, and offer a unique example of adaptation and societal development within the Star Wars universe. Their homeworld is situated in the Midrim at Grid Coordinates L18 within the Cal system. The system is characterized by a single sun and one moon, setting a celestial stage that is relatively common amongst many known planetary systems. But what makes Debrin really unique is its planetary composition. Unlike terrestrial worlds with vast land masses, Debrin is entirely covered by small oceans. This aquatic landscape is punctuated by coral reefs and sandbars, which break the surface of the water, adding a dynamic and varied topography to the planet. Such a configuration is somewhat akin to the oceanic worlds like Mon Cala, yet Tabrin's shallow oceans and prevalent sandbars are really what make it distinct. The planet's ocean currents played a pivotal role in its climatic stability. These currents distribute warm water uniformly around Tabrin, creating a temperate zone that envelops the entire planet. Whereas most other worlds have more varied climatic zones, due to differences in geography and solar heating. The Shitib civilization has impressively adapted to these conditions. The cities are not only built on the reefs, but also incorporate coral materials into their construction. This practice highlights a deep connection and harmony with their environment, similar to how the Gungans of Naboo utilized organic materials in their underwater cities. The Ishitib's approach to food production reflects their adaptation to their oceanic environment. They cultivate edible seaweed and breed fish within underwater corrals, a sustainable practice that ensures a balance with their ecosystem, a bit more technologically advanced than the Amani, but still nowhere near Coruscant. Their physical characteristics are as intriguing as their cultural and environmental adaptations, standing at an average height of 1.8 meters, or approximately 5 feet 11 inches, and weighing around 60 kilograms, or 132 pounds. Ishi tibs align closely with human averages in terms of size. However, their amphibious nature and unique physiological features set them distinctly apart from many humanoid species. What you'll notice first is their distinctive head shape, often described as star-shaped. This unique morphology is primarily due to their large eyes positioned on stalks, beak-like mouths, and prominent cheek pouches, all combining to form a five-pointed star-like appearance. It's not only visually distinctive, but also suggests a high degree of sensory adaptation. Their stalked eyes, for instance, might offer a wider range of vision akin to some features found on aquatic planets like Mon Cala. Their amphibious nature is further highlighted by their specialized respiratory system, with their lungs doubling as internal gills, enabling them to breathe efficiently both on land and underwater. This dual functionality is a remarkable evolutionary trait, though it is rarely seen in some other amphibians. The Ishitib's acute sense of smell, effective in both aquatic and terrestrial environments, is another evolutionary advantage, allowing them to detect changes in their surroundings and communicate effectively. This heightened sensory ability is crucial for survival, but also social interaction, kind of like the Tegruda, whose Lekus are able to interpret pheromones and pick up different scents in the environment, acting as another layer to communication, like how we might pick up on somebody's body language to understand if they're angry or happy or sarcastic. Their skin, a green hue capable of retaining humidity, is another adaptation to their watery lifestyle. However, this feature comes with a significant vulnerability, the need to bathe in salt water every 30 hours to prevent their skin from cracking, leading to potentially fatal internal and external bleeding. This requirement for regular immersion in salt water underscores their deep connection to their aquatic environment, and though not for the exact same reason, partially why many Mon Cala ships famously have entire aquatic sections. And to give the Empire a break it might not deserve, it's a great example of just how complex having a ship full of so many different species can be. It's just a nice look at how complex a ship can be when you try to accommodate the needs of so many different species with extremely different evolutionary backgrounds. Keeping the entire Empire human might be just a specious issue, but they also didn't have to worry about things like this. With their language, Tiburnese, being a unique amalgamation of sounds produced by clacking with those beak-like mouths, combined with a variety of squeaks and honks, And it's unclear if other species were able to pick this up. It might be difficult to mimic with a human mouth. And I'm assuming Wookiees are deferring to the protocol droid. Their evolutionary history is quite remarkable. Originating from fish, they adapted to life on land by escaping predators and inhabiting the coral reefs. The more shallow the area, the more safety there was, and apparently this led to them hanging out on the sand dunes. Their intelligence grew alongside their physical evolution, leading them to construct their first cities on those same coral reefs, and spending their days in these raised structures and in the sea. Their society is organized into small, close-knit communities known as schools, acting like giant tribes or even city-states, since they often reached around 10,000 individuals. Governance within these schools is democratic, with representatives elected to one-year terms. And this communal and representative system would focus on ecological preservation as the cornerstone of Ishitib law and culture. 
All new tech undergoes rigorous testing before implementation, ensuring minimal ecological impact, as environmental disasters spread a lot quicker through this shallow water that all their cities stood on. In line with their environmental ethos, the Ishitib used beasts for labor, reducing reliance on potentially harmful machinery, showing a focus on a symbiotic relationship over technological convenience. Reproduction among the Ishitib is community-focused. They lay fertilized eggs in communal hatcheries, and the young are raised collectively with no one knowing exactly who the mother and father are of any particular kid. This communal approach to child rearing, devoid of traditional family structures like marriage, is pretty rare among all humanoid species across the galaxy, with almost all others having some form of traditional nuclear family. Off-world, Ishitib are known for the meticulous strategical and managerial skills, many finding success in executive roles, leveraging their organizational prowess and environmental consciousness. And while some misread this as them just being peace and love hippie fish folk, they maintained a primal ferocity, especially evident in combat, where they can be unexpectedly savage, using those powerful lungs for endurance and that beak to bite through flesh and bone. Tabrina, the capital city of Tabrin, shows off the pinnacle of Ishitib architectural and societal organization, governed by a Mariod and spiritually guided by a Kalkidan. In combination with the voting populace, these three branches are kept in check. It's unclear when they had first contact with alien species or were brought into the larger galactic community via the Republic, but many noticed they had a unique appreciation for music and entertainment, favoring loud sirens, clanging whoops and flashing lights and ringing bells preference likely stems from their unique sensory capabilities and their large communal, let's call them breeding parties. During the Clone Wars, the Ishitib found themselves at a crossroads of galactic politics and internal divisions, with Tabrin becoming a focal point of conflict between the Galactic Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems. They would officially be brought into the CIS via Dooku, though they continued to be represented in the Galactic Senate by Guam Zam. The majority of Ishitib on Tabrin initially supported Count Dooku, mostly because he was able to overthrow their dictator, Surabrand II. Despite having three branches and trying to keep everything in balance, Tu had become a great symbol of these last decades of the Republic, convincing officials that there was an anti-Republic coup bubbling up on his world, using Republic resources to squash this, which effectively saw him kill a considerable number of his own people, a sort of mini Palpatine that was able to rule as dictator in this special time of emergency. He was actually killed by Dooku, who correctly assumed that by taking out this hated figure, he could win over the hearts and minds of most Ishitib people. But because they still held out hope for galactic unity, they made sure to keep their senator in the Republic as well. But the Republic would want to force them to take a side. Commander Gree of the 41st Elite Corps, Marshal Commander Cody of the 212th, and Commander Rex of the 501st were among the troop leadership during the Battle of Tabrin. Though not all were in love with the CIS, what they hated even more is that the Republic would send troops to their world to try and make this decision for them. An initiative reluctantly initiated an environmental disaster, damaging their precious coral reefs with the thousands of gallons of clone trooper blood that flowed into their shallow seas. Despite this devastating loss, their leadership was able to negotiate with other Republic Senators, and Senator Guam Sam, despite being affiliated with the Techno Union and often being seen as too sympathetic to the CIS, he was also a member of groups opposing Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's growing power, really showing just how complicated politics got toward the end of the war. And it was to honor the comrades lost at Tabrin that Commander Gree and many of his other clone survivors would start shaving their heads in this red-colored double stripe pattern, remembering the blood spilt by their brothers. And there were several notable Ishitib across the galaxy. One was a member of the infamous Onaka Gang, and shortly after the Clone Wars, still in 19 BBY, Haka Hai emerged as a notorious figure on the swampy world of Mimban. And in the years leading up to the Battle of Yavin, an Ishitib rebel leader was captured and tragically forced to take his own life in order to avoid interrogation by Imperial droids. By 4 ABY, there was an Ishitib in Jabba the Hutt's palace, in the rebel briefing room prior to the attack on the second Death Star, we see that there are four prominent Ishitib in rebel leadership. By the Galactic War, we see an unusual ecological crisis on Tabrin, the strange algae in the southern reefs causing fish to explode. This shows just how delicate the balance of Tabrin's ecosystem was, and how fragile it was to the interference by off-world entities, as it was likely from some alien species' ships, though who knows, it might have been the long-lasting effects of Gree's brothers. By around 9 ABY, we see an unnamed member of the Ishitib species, perhaps one of those that was in the planning of the Death Star 2 attack, serving aboard Captain Garrard's cruiser to the Danab system. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, www.starwars.com, I'm at best here, in Tunisia, in Tunisia, trying to give some people some air in the heads, airheads, 
We're here with Trisha. Trisha, how you doing? Hi, good, thanks. Bit warm out here, so we're just going to give this guy some air. We're just going to prop his mouth open a bit. Got a bit of a tear happening here, so I'll have to do some minor repairs on this. They made their first debut in 1983 in Return of the Jedi with concept sculptor Chris Wallace being responsible for the design of the Ishi Tib. In early stages, they were nicknamed Starfish, and envisioned with pink skin. Though once we get the model that we actually see in Jabba's palace, it was nicknamed the Bird Lizard during production. Interestingly, the name Ishi Tib might have been originally intended to refer to a single character, not the entire species. In James Kahn's novelization of Return of the Jedi, quote, Ishi Tib the Bird Lizard is mentioned as one of the members of Jabba's entourage. If you want to learn more, be sure to check out these resources, and please hit that like button, it really is the best way to help me out. Subscribe to see more, and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, if you start getting blood on the fish folks coral, they're just going to want to kill you even harder. And the Force will be with you, always.